And mine's very easy. Whenever people ask me, I'm like, I read the beginning because it just tells you what's going on. We're in the internet. We're stuck there. Everybody's stuck there till we die. That's what's happening. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Edinburgh International Book Festival. We are broadcasting live from our bedrooms, but also from um, Edinburgh College of Art, where we're being hosted by the University of Edinburgh as part of a long-term partnership. My name is Charlie Brinkus Cuff, Cuff, rather. I'm a journalist and editor, and I'm currently working at the New, New York Times, um, and I have a new book coming out in September, Black Joy. I am thrilled to be joined today by the authors Raven Leilani and Patricia Lockwood to explore their books through the lens of contemporary life and society in all of its contradictions, entanglements, and fragmentation. Welcome, Raven and Patricia. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having <laughs> us. <laughs> So on to the books. Um, so Patricia's No One Is Talking About This is a genre-defying examination of family, grief, loss, and how we experience them in the shadow of the internet. It was shortlisted for the Women's Prize for Fiction and longlisted for the 2021 Booker Prize. And it also stayed on my mind for like a weirdly long time after I read it as well. So thank you for that, Patricia. Um, and in Raven's beautiful and sharp novel Luster, the protagonist Edie is trying to manage her simmering quarter-life crisis while also navigating an increasingly complex set of reels about sex, relationships and racial politics. It was a winner of the Dylan Thomas Prize 2021 and this book is the book that I went and told all of my best friends about. I was like I just need to talk about this with someone. Um, so yeah I'm, I'm really excited for us to get into them. Just before we start I'm going to give you a little breakdown of the how the event is going to run. Firstly please give us your questions we would love to answer them um, but there's going to be a QA and a right at the end and we'll try and answer as many as possible. Um, we're going to kick off with a reading from both of the books. Um, we'll go into my questions and then we'll go to yours. Um, so without further ado um, I think Raven is going to kick us off with a little reading from Luster. Perfect. Um, so this, it's really, really cool to be here with you both. Um, this is really exciting. Um, I'm such a fan. Uh, so I'm just going to preface this really quick. Uh, so in this moment in the book, Edie, um, our protagonist, is looking for a new job. She's just lost her job and is maintaining a kind of tenuous texting connection with the man she's seeing at the time. So he kind of pops in and out as she's uh, trying to find employment. In the morning, no jobs have contacted me, but there is a text from Eric accompanied by a photo of a fully erect seraphim. He writes, take a look at that grass. The color is called verdigris and they used to make it by boiling copper and vinegar. And I don't respond because I can't bring myself to do anything but get up to go to the bathroom. And even that is something I have to convince myself to do because I have not once wet myself in adulthood and I think perhaps I'm due. A couple days after that, I put some water in a glass and drink it and Eric sends me a picture of a chimera with a star-shaped tongue. He writes, in the tradition of the grotesque, the art of the grotesque. But how cool is this? In the beginning, grotesque just meant ornate. And I send out a few job applications and take a shower. I start to shave my legs, but on the second leg, the lights turn off and I stand there in the dark with the razor, feeling like the universe is suggesting something. Eric texts me more photos of gargoyles and vagina dentata, and no jobs call me back, even when I revise my resume daily and spend money in Marshalls on a pantsuit. At the time I feel able to contribute to our conversation, it becomes obvious that this is not a conversation. It becomes obvious that he does not intend to acknowledge me or the night I spent in his home. The texts come intermittently and without prompting. So Eric usually sends them around noon and midnight, which tells me that I occur to him during lunch and perhaps while he is still in bed. In between these texts, I want to ask him what he's eating. I want to ask him why he's awake. But then I worry he'll remember I'm on the other end and the text will stop. This is the way it was when our relationship existed online. We told each other things so awful that by necessity, we adopted the posture of speaking in jest. Though we had gone through the trouble to create a language and the effort of this alone betrayed our seriousness. And then we met. Then I got into his car and had to recalibrate, gave him eyelashes and veins under his hands and a freckle on his chin. And suddenly it seemed indecent to acknowledge any of the things we'd said. And so when he texts me a photo of a satyr being skinned and says, dig the saffron and gold leaf, you use synthetic compound to counteract the pores. I say nothing. Some days later, I snag an interview for a corporate gig in Long Island City. But when I get there, it's just a staffing firm and the woman I meet tells me that she is a client looking for a waste management associate. When I show up to the dump, 
The mid-August heat is so relentless that the creases I ironed into my pants melt away. By the time I arrive in the main office, I reverted to a liquid state. My interviewer asking me how much I can haul, to which I respond with an overestimation about 50 pounds. The vibe in the room a little bit ku klux until I go to the bathroom and see that for the length of my interview, my mascara has been running and there are big black tears still making their way down my cheeks. This is something I want to tell Eric, but because of our gaping economic disparity, I don't know how to express myself without it seeming like I'm asking for help. So I send my social security to an email linked to an office in Silicon Valley, where a popular in-app delivery system is based. In three days, I, they send me a hat and a carrier bag with thermal insulation to keep the delivery as warm. They grant me access to a map that shows the areas of the city with the highest demand. Heavily populated areas show up dark red and less populated areas tend to rain, remain pink until lunchtime when demand is high even in the sleepy hamlets of Queens. I ride my bike to an address in Sunset Park and when the customer comes to the door, she snatches the bag of waffle fries and doesn't tip. Most of the time, I stay in Brooklyn. I get the first orders of no pulp orange juice and champagne out of the way, make pit stops for vanilla jewel pods and small orders of LaCroix and Pampers. I make my home, my home base Holy Cross Cemetery so I can hydrate in relative peace and also because it's smack dab in the middle of Flatbush and the orders come in from all sides. Technically, I'm not allowed to transport anything that qualifies as a drug, but there are prep school kids who need bubble tea and Marlboros, dog walkers who need boxed wine and leave detailed instructions about where in prospect to make the drop, pump and dumping mommies who emerge from Grand Army Market desperate for gin. Everyone is excited to see me and I'm sort of excited to see them the habitual Bensonhurst McFlurries, the Gen X brownstoners who for some reason use the app to order pizza, Coney Islanders looking to indulge in brunch from afar and just happy you came out, the West Indian pockets of Eastern Parkway and their cash oniaki and cocoa bread, buku tips on the days I wear the company hat and beat the average time, though occasionally I take the bridge over and field requests by canal where I try to protect borders of squid from all that direct sun. But for all the visits I make, they never go beyond hello. I try to segue from light, converse, light observations about the weather, but in the few who are receptive, between my strict schedule of work and sleep, I find I don't have the bandwidth to offer anything more. So I listen to NPR on my route and try to get some talking points. I find a segment about a journalist who received a string of violent emails in 2009. The journalist reads part of one email and laughs. She says, he wrote to me on the first of every month. He would say these things like, you redacted whore. How do men find you redacted? And I felt like it's not even constructive if you have an issue with my reporting, okay. Then they bring the man who sent the emails on air and he says, I'm sorry, I was having a rough year. If I go home, it's usually for the bathroom I know and love, that there is a mom and pop tie joint in Gravesend with a sterling private restroom. And they're so grateful for how much food I moved that they let me use it for free. I try not to take any deliveries with a high probability of soup. And I try to obey traffic laws, though sometimes there's a wedding, a parade or a murder that forces me to rush and leave my bike in the legal place. With a new diet of pear baby food and top ramen, I make almost enough money to live, though some of that is due to the payout from my publisher. Then I receive news that my rent is going up. The news comes in a brown, grease-stained envelope, and because I usually only receive mail from student loan consolidation scams and instant approval credit card companies that use old rap icons to target low-income Blacks, I almost miss it. My roommate calls a meeting while I'm out falling from my bike into a customer's cheesecake, and as soon as I climb the stairs, she is there with a suitcase saying she's moving to a gut renovated building in Harlem with her boyfriend and send me a picture of your pussy, it pings onto my screen. As I watch my roommate leave, the idea that I have a pussy seems preposterous. I move through the apartment and try to reconcile the existence of the clitoris with the broccoli smell my roommate left behind. I rinse the cheesecake from my hair and get back out on my route. When the men who line, where the men who line the street remind me that technically, yes, I do have a pussy and I will leave with the terror of protecting it for the rest of my life. But after a big haul of spices from halal food, I go ahead and take a picture of it in the bathroom of McDonald's. Then I go back to my newly empty apartment, Google utility SROs in the Bronx and introduce some saline into my anal cavity. I watch Seinfeld comb Jason Alexander's IMDb and head to Manhattan to make a little more cash. I bike the Queensboro Bridge and mop my face and armpits in the, in the bathroom of a pret. I check the delivery map and Uptown is already deep red, a swath of demand from Harlem to 59th and Lex for the matcha and hemp offerings of corporate quirky or decidedly snide coffee giants. The bike lanes in Manhattan already terrifying at 11 a.m., filled with delivery boys and girls who jet into traffic with fried rice and no, le no reason to live, along with the sentient abdominals who do this for fun. Foreign pedestrians standing right in the way, taking selfies and checking their luggage for pigeon shit. As far as Eric is concerned, there is no genital reciprocity. 
He sends a photo of himself holding a vial of powdered silver. And despite his general old manness regarding the art of the selfie and his dorky archival gloves, I want him. I have been waiting for a reason to rescind my attraction. I hoped in the two weeks we had been apart, I could be objective and find something wrong with him. But after this month, all I want is to be kissed. I ask my customers to confirm my name at times to be sure I have the right address, but mostly just to hear the sound. Thank you. That's beautiful, Raven. Thank you. Yeah, I can see Trisha doing the, the little thing. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, yeah, that was stunning. And I think there was a lot in there that I feel like relates to the theme of today, which is obviously why you chose it as a reading. Um, but yeah, you know, the way in which she obviously used the internet, the kind of urgency and like pain in which she's kind of jumping between these different spaces and places in her life um zero hour contracts it's all quite fragmentary and, and and really fascinating as well um was there a particular reason for you why you chose that that part of the book to focus on today absolutely I mean I think that I mean I in general I kind of have a lot to say on like what gets lost like the kind of human parts that get lost at that clip when you're trying to meet those demands to live um but also the way that you know the She's attempting to make these, these connections. She's attempting to seek intimacy through these like digital channels. And, uh, and that sort of medium, it, it kind of distorts it. It distorts it in a way that is, that's, that's interesting at the very least. That's kind of a, you know, not exactly the word, but it, it changes the sort of um, tenor of that interaction. Yeah, for sure. And I think the beginning of the, the extract you just read was a bit that really stayed with me actually, like when she kind of is talking through how different her relationship is with him when, yeah. you know, on the internet versus in real life. And I just thought that I've had that, I've experienced that and, and it is strange and yes. it's very much of our age. I don't think, you know, I mean, I feel like maybe letter writing, they might have experienced something similar back <laughs> in the golden days, but like, you know, it's not, it's not quite the same. Um, Patricia, I feel like there's some kind of neat links between that extra tract that was just read and your book I don't know if there was any thoughts you initially had while listening to it no absolutely and I really I really like the passage that you chose I think that's what we would call like the tour de force passage the bravura passage if we're talking <laughs> about like Don DeLillo or some like <laughs> old guy that's what we would call it but yeah I mean you're talking about vagina dentata and you're talking about marshals you know like <laughs> we've all been in the pret doing that same thing yes. um so you know that you share this reality even if it's not exactly your reality um, and I think the thing about it is it really puts you on the pavement. I think the thing that I wanted in the first half of my novel was to sort of um, communicate the ephemerality. And then in the second half to talk about what it feels like to really be put in your shoes and set yes. walking. Yes. And you have to walk. So they, they have talked about your novel, Raven, being like a, a, flaneuse, a, a flaneuse's novel. Um, but there's also like the guy who gets to walk around the city, you know, eternally at his leisure. And then there's also the necessity. There's like, you know, walking the city out of a sort of necessity because you're pressed to do this. And that looks a little bit different. Yeah. Um, but also, I mean, in terms of the, the, the dance that is a, a courtship ritual like what we just heard you know it's it's it is letter writing and courtship ritual rituals are highly prescribed the steps of the dance are highly prescribed and they still exist in this form wanting to show that these things are eternal that they still exist in these new forms I think yes. it must be a, yeah. a common project a shared project that's what I would say <laughs> and it was very deep and beautiful um yeah. And on that note, I would love to hear you read from your book now. And mine's very easy. Whenever people ask me, I'm like, I read the beginning because it just tells you what's going on. We're in the internet. We're stuck there. Everybody's stuck there till we die. That's what's happening. Excellent. And I read the same thing every time. So. No worries at all. She opened the portal and the mind met her more than halfway. Inside, it was tropical and snowing and the first flake of the blizzard of everything landed on her tongue and melted. Close-ups of nail art, a pebble from outer space, a tarantula's compound eyes, a storm like canned peaches on the surface of Jupiter, Van Gogh's the potato eaters, a chihuahua perched on a man's erection, a garage door spray painted with the words, stop, don't email my wife. <laughs> Why did the portal feel so private? when you only entered it when you needed to be everywhere. She felt along the solid green marble of the day for the hairline crack that might let her out. This could not be forced. 
Outside, the air hung swagged, and the clouds sat in piles of couch stuffing. And in the south of the sky, there was a tender spot where a rainbow wanted to happen. Then three sips of coffee and a window opened. I'm convinced the world is getting too full, LOL, her brother texted her, the one who obliterated himself at the end of every day with a personal comment called Fireball. Capitalism. It was important to hate it, even though it was how you got money. Slowly, slowly, she found herself moving toward a position so philosophical even Jesus couldn't have held it, that she must hate capitalism while at the same time loving film montages set in department stores. Politics. The trouble was that they had a dictator now, which according to some people, white, they had never had before. And according to other people, everyone else, they had only ever been having constantly since the beginning of the world. Her stupidity panicked her, as well as the way her voice now sounded when she talked to people who hadn't stopped being stupid yet. The problem was that the dictator was very funny, which had maybe always been true of all dictators. Absurdism, she thought. Suddenly all those Russian novels where a man turns into a teaspoonful of blackberry jam in a country house began to make sense. What had the beautiful thought been? The bright profundity she had roused herself to write down. She opened her notebook with the sense of anticipation she always felt on such occasions. Perhaps this would finally be it, the one they would chisel on her gravestone. It read, Chuck E. Cheese can munch a hole in my you-know-what. After you died, she thought as she carefully washed her legs under the fine needles of water, for she had recently learned that some people didn't. You would see a little pie chart that told you how much of your life had been spent in the shower arguing with people you had never met. Oh, but like that was somehow less worthy than spending your time carefully monitoring the thickness of beaver houses for signs of the severity of the coming winter? Was she stimming? She feared very much that she was. Things that were always there. The sun, her body and the barest riffling at the roots of her hair and almost music in the air, unarranged and primary and swirling, like yarns laid out in their colors waiting. The theme song of a childhood show where mannequins came to life at night in a department store. Anonymous history channel footage of gray millions on the march, shark snouted airplanes, silk deployments of missiles, mushroom clouds. An episode of True Life about a girl who liked to oil herself up, get into a pot with assorted vegetables, and pretend that cannibals were going to eat her, sexually. The almost formed unthought, is there a bug on me? And a great shame about all of it, all of it. <laughs> I just like to read a little. I'm like, that's it, that, I go on like that for like a hundred pages. You get the basic idea. <laughs> It was beautifully done, and I can tell that you've done that before. Like you know, the, the that bit, yes, the rhythm, yeah, I've got it, yeah. Got it down, you got it down. Um, I when I first read this opening, like sort of like part of the novel, I just was like, oh, I am so online. I yeah. know. Princes <laughs> are. Um, I don't know if it was the same for you as well, Raven. But um, the, the Chihuahua one was new for me. I don't know if that was actually pulled from. Like, oh, a little... I can post it again later if you just slide by the feed. You know, you see that little Chihuahua. There is there is a certain aspect of my Twitter that is a little bit deeper online. I think than some. It's a little bit deeper in the wormhole than some others. And it's like I can picture it, man. I'm like, yeah, he's just like he's in a speedo. The Chihuahua's right there. I'm never erasing that image from my mind. I'm going to see it on my deathbed. You know? So. <laughs> I know it very well. I can give that gift to you as well on Thank my feed. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I mean, I think it's an obvious question, Patricia, but I, I wonder like when you were writing this, like obviously by its nature, especially at the beginning of the novel, it is fragmentary. You're kind of flipping between all of these different things. How did you go about making sure that it still felt whole and that you still kind of understood who this human was in all these like, it's almost separate parts of her like disparate brain that were flicking between things. This was very interesting because of course I went like mental on that, making sure that the thread held and went all the way through, um, stitched itself through the entire novel. And I spent days placing a single fragment and kicking something else out and moving this here, playing Tetris with this, doing this with that. And I think it would have held anyway. 
um, because I think that it replicates the texture that you experience online. And you don't choose those fragments there. They take on meaning through their juxtaposition with each other. So obviously there were things that had to uh, be kicked out eventually. Like, you know, you figure out along the way that some things are more ephemeral than others, that some things have some sort of permanence beyond what you're describing, so that if people encounter them in 15, 20, 25 years, they can still picture something, even if they don't know the specific chihuahua on the specific erection. So we have an added layer of texture. We, we know these things. There's an added layer for, of meaning for us, but there will also be uh, added layers of meaning in the future. Uh, other things will have passed. They'll take their own associations. So I wanted to control it very, very strongly. And I think that it would have held anyway. I think it would have happened no matter how I did it. Yeah. I mean, just as an, if I can like just jump in, I, I just want to say um, that that is, that feels really good to hear, hearing you talk about how you, how you preserved that, you know, the sort of entirety of the project, because I, I do, I, you feel like the, the kind of gravity of the image, but the distillation of the image and how they're strung together. But hearing you talk about the time you spend on that connective tissue um, personally feels good for me because I think that's often where I spend the most time, yeah. you know, and it's, and it feels, um, it's deeply frustrating. I think um, it's a deeply frustrating part of, of writing um, but it is, it just feels good to have heard you say that that is a part where you kind of, um, have to linger. Yes. And I went crazy. I'll be fully, fully, um, yeah, I was totally like driving myself into the institution over that, but you have to, at a certain point, you forget that the reader brings their own synapses to the work. Mm -hmm. They bring their own leaps to it. And this is the communication between you and the reader. You're making leaps within the novel and then you two are making leaps between yourselves, between each other. Um, so yeah, some of it must be about, maybe that's a better way to look at it, to think about trust, to think, um, about the fact that there is something there that the spark will jump from person to person. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess you know, I, then going to the broadest of broad themes in, in our discussion, do you guys like the use of the word fragmentary to describe your novels? Like, do you think that that, that doesn't quite capture that element of connective tissue that you spent so hard, like curating and making sure it sort of spills through? I'm interested in your thoughts, Raven. No, I mean, I I definitely didn't, as I wrote, um, and it could just be a symptom of the fact that as I'm writing, I'm not, I'm not really thinking about how I'm writing and and, and what it is that I'm writing. And I barely, I mean, I don't, it's a cop out to say that you don't understand your own work, but it does feel like a completely separate thing, especially when it's been exercised. Um, but I, I honestly think that was one of the things that I, I learned about my own work once it was in the world. I wouldn't have ever reached for that word, though I would say, you know, as I was listening to Patricia Reed, you know, I think I thought immediately of the kind of shape and speed of poetry, you know, and I always, that's sort of always what I'm looking to when I'm stuck, how I get unstuck is I, is I look to poetry and, and poetry is, it does the thing that is hardest for me, which is movement, which is transition. And I think, perhaps you feel that difficulty in like, in the sort of those natural fractures that happen on the page, but also it's like, a, you know, it's a byproduct of um, a kind of deeply fractured consciousness, which is trying to, you know, at once um, kind of cement these intimacies at once survive and, and, and make some cash, you know, claim a right to make art, um, claim the right to be abject and to be obliterated, you know, without apology. And also like that obliteration itself is, which is happening to her all the time, uh, psychically, physically, and some of it is invited. I think, you know, all of those things come together and um, create a sort of fragmented, you know, feeling. Uh, but as I wrote, I, I honestly, I, it is not a word that actually would have occurred to me, but it's something that I really appreciate. Uh, it's, it's a part of a, a thing that I appreciate in having your work be out there and and finding new language um, uh, to understand it with. For sure, absolutely. And um, I heard, you oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, no, I was going, is, is that okay? I'm gonna yeah. also, I'm gonna talk now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I heard the poetry as well when Raven was reading the repetitions at the beginning of sentences. Poetry 
uh, provides us with lyric transitions when it's it's more difficult sometimes to make transitions in time because you're experiencing you're trying to express a different kind of flow of time. So poetry is the perfect vehicle for that, and I think that that is maybe something we are both doing. Um, yeah, the terms come later and they're diagnostic or they're you know something they're describing symptoms of the book right rather than the totality of it rather than the person, and they're also for readers so that they have a handle to grab. So. I think in that sense, they're useful. But I've done many of these Zooms now, as Raven and I and Charlie were discussing beforehand. And I kept, I got this tick at one point where I kept mispronouncing um, the word fragments. So it was like a book in, in fragments. And I would always say that it was a book in fragrance, like a book in perfume. So we just started using that instead because it was so much more beautiful. But it also kind of conveys some of the same thing. Like there's just that little like waft of pie smell like you know threading its way through the book right <laughs> a book of fragrance so uh you're free to use that if you don't like um fragmentary novel <laughs> thank you're, you can use that too <laughs> i think you should definitely borrow that like i'm going to use that to describe both of your novels from now on so um but yeah patricia i know that you do poetry as well so like was that i presume that was like a big influence on like how you constructed the book too Yes, absolutely. Um, and it was also, it was frustrating too, because I don't switch gears well. So I would like to have this life where I'm writing essays and reviews and novels and other things. And at the same time, I'm, I'm still able to maintain a life in poetry. And the reality was that in a book like this, I didn't write any poetry. When I was writing it, I just wrote the book. I think that all of the poetry went into it. I think all of it went into the language. Um, so that is is a, a comfort and a relief. But you do wish, you know, that you could go to sleep at night and, and live your life in poetry then and, you know, be free maybe of the the day-to-day -day work of prose, which is different. Yes. Um, Raven, I, I thought we could get onto some of the nitty-gritty of the characters now. I'm gonna go right in. Um, and with Edie, and it actually happened to be the the exact uh, passage that you read, I, I was thinking a lot just about how the characters weren't necessarily showing their full selves to each other at different parts in the book. Um, and I, I, I well, I, I wondered if you thought that was a fair like assessment or what you thought about that and um, specifically in relation to obviously the difference between internet self and real life I'm here as a person self um and also there was a there was a quote um where Edie's kind of talking about the adjust adjustments that she needs to make yes. when she walks into every room I think and um and just how you present different elements of yourself to different people at the correct time um yeah. Yeah, does, does I think that's fair. No, I, I absolutely think that's that's fair. And then fully um, was one of the, you know, um, was a, one of the hearts of the project. Mm -hmm. And it, it's funny because we, we talk about, you know, fragments and we talk about, you know, we talk about the internet and we talk about the digital self and uh, like the, the actual self. And, and in some cases they're, in a lot of cases they're perhaps one. And we talk about the way in which they are, uh, you kind of have to give yourself over to the theater and, and sort of accept that that is an, an aspect of that. But um, there is theater, right? In, in being a sort of black woman about, about life, kind of making those sort of frequent and, and daily um, calculations around what is safe to show which face is, is appropriate for which environment. I mean, th there's, you could say it's, it's code switching, um, but you could, all, which I think is more, you know, uh, sort of like more uh, situated in like professional context, but it also is, it's a certain kind of like internal vetting that you're doing constantly um, with the people that you're with and with the people who are perhaps urging you um, to show the, you know, whatever they, consider the, the genuine face. And so with that first relationship, you know, she is, she's doing that. She's calculating and she is aware, entirely aware of both the sort of fantasy that she's inhabiting for this person and her desire and, and wanting to, wanting to be that, but also her, I mean, her knowledge of the way that that distorts th distorts their intimacy uh, and the kind of the, the falseness of that, but the, but it's a kind of falseness that that keeps her safe, um, and in and it's a falseness that is also part of that sort of 
erotic and uh, psychological landscape. Um, and so I, as I was writing, as I was writing Edie as a character, like that was sort of a big part of why um, it's an eye is because I, I, there's so much theater, there's so much performance um, and it is all, some of it is, is due in part to that kind of um, the armor that she understands that she has to sort of erect in order to keep herself safe. Um, but I, I needed there to be a window into um, the more unvarnished self, the part that was angry, the part that is, um, you know, the part that is contradictory, um, the part that is that is deeply earnest. You know, it, it's funny to to be writing and like trying to kind of use irony as a tool. And that happens because you have the hyperbole of, of what is happening to her on like a sort of a daily level against her resignation, the thing she has to, you know, kind of her armor, how she has to get through it. But the heart of it for me was always, um, always about earnestness. It was always about um, what is frustrating her ability to be fully earnest. And, and it was always about um like the sort of the the shagginess, the difficulty of that when you are um, I, when one you're sort of contending with uh, you know the the sort of mandate to perform and to be to perform a, a like a a respect like a kind of a pristine version, uh, but also to perform a kind of stoicism and a strength, uh, yeah. and so the project of this book, very long answer to this question, um, was just to, was to kind of tease apart those performances, but to write more toward um, what is being def deferred um, amidst that theater. That's, that's a fantastic, fantastic answer. And as you were speaking, I was kind of pulling up all these different moments in the book where um, Edie lives that. So like, you know, from her being on the roller coaster, to that moment outside of the office with the other um, black staff member after she's kind of gone in there and like tried to paste a smile on her face and then is thinking about what she should say to her. Um, yeah, I mean, what do you think is the most earnest moment in the book for her, like when she is at her, I don't know, at her I mean, I would say yeah. it's always when she's at her, whatever form her easel is taking at the moment, you know, mm -hmm. it's it's those, at least, and then that could be just me projecting onto the book, right? <laughs> I just think that, those moments where there's doubt, that's, that's earnest to me, mm -hmm. um, where you're grappling with, you're grappling with your want and you're grappling with your limits and you're, you're kind of daring to fail. <laughs> and, and that's a huge part of why I wrote this book too, because I'm obsessed with failure and, um, you kind of have to be earnest to, you know, to wade into those waters. You have to be earnest to show your neck. Absolutely. Um, Patricia, for you, one of the, like, I was um, heartbroken and, and, and also kind of thrilled to read the second half of, of the book, um, where you kind of get to meet the baby and um, all that comes with it. I don't want to give away too many spoilers. Um, but I thought one of the really interesting things, again, in relation to the theme was that the baby's existence could be viewed as almost quite fragmentary because she's like not necessarily, or as it's explained, she's not necessarily got all of her senses and all of, all of that kind of thing. But actually it's, it completely problematizes that. And she's kind of shown to be experiencing the world through, well, certainly through the protagonist's eyes as more deep and connected and broad than pretty much anyone that I've ever read about before. Um, why did you decide to, to or, or is that how you perceive it? And, and why did you decide to show it in that way? Yeah, when you say it that way, I think it, it's, it's how in the first half of the book, we are experiencing meaning despite the form, um, despite what we're, the rubble of what we're encountering. Um, the second half of the book was so largely taken from personal experiences that I will sometimes just speak from those, if that is okay. We were told about my niece that um, she would have basically no interaction with us at all, that she would not recognize us, that if she lived, she would never get to the point of being able to count to three, anything like that. They, they showed us a, a projection of her brain MRI and it, it looked even to an untrained eye so different. Um, 
it did not look, you know, as you would expect your own brain to look if, if it were projected on a wall. Um, but what happened as time passed is that, you know, bearing this pronouncement in mind, we, we expected less. And so we kept being surprised. And what we found is that we could bring the world to her, uh, that she was experiencing meaning through, through these portals that we didn't understand, we didn't know how much she had, but that we could bring her things to those portals. And we could put little flowers there. We could bring the, the sapphires of the world to her. So then it became something in our lives that's like, what can we show her? What can we play for her? What can we bring to her? And it's like, wasn't that what the internet was like a little bit? What can I bring to people? What can I show other people? What flowers can I put there? And it wasn't like, oh my God, what if I made this lesson about you know a, a child and I show what the internet is truly like and a better version of it? It wasn't like that at all. These were just resonances. And part of it was about the fact that you know a lot of us have felt trapped in the internet, certainly over the years of the Trump administration, but for a lot of us long before that, um, what exactly was it that we were experiencing in there? Um, and how did that contrast with what she experienced, the form of meaning um, that, that she experienced because we brought it to her? So a lot of this was instinctual, clearly, because you know I experienced it in my own life. I experienced that rupture, you know, um, of, of my online life and, and this turn and into what it became, this life with my niece. Um, so it, it was reproduced there almost, almost exactly as it was. Um, but I think that the reason it, it feels meaningful is because those, those parallels, those resonances are there. Beautiful. Raven, you said that you were a, a, a fan of Patricia's book. Um, how did you sort of perceive the the kind of switch from the first half to the second half? I mean, I think that um, I, I really hear you in talking about like not your intent was not to um, not to render it into a lesson, right? About about sort of what is the sort of <laughs> falseness versus versus realness. Um, but I do think that what excited me about that was that you you show how both can be true, like how both can be real. Um, and I feel like it's it's hard to, um, anything I feel like you say about the, the internet, about the sort of performance, about the theater around it, it feels like two days pass and the diagnosis that you have, the analysis that you have um, ages, that ages a million years. Um, mm -hmm. But I do think that there's a, a deeply, in both, in both a kind of um, a yearning, both a kind of a, a frustration of communication. Um, and I feel like I'm not like articulating my, myself exactly as I want, um, but I'm always looking toward, I'm always looking toward art that remains open in its sort of moral gestures. You know that it treats it treats those contradictions as as valuable. Uh, so I think that that is sort of um, that's like the best um, way I can sort of articulate that. Thank you. That's very that's a very generous reading. Yeah, I love that. Um, have I'm I'm curious to know what the kind of feedback has been like to both of your books and. Um, have, do you feel like people have been, have felt seen by your protagonists and, you know, has, has anyone come up to you, Raven, and been like, I'm needy, or like, obviously your, <laughs> your character's name was Peter, but like. You know. I'm needy. I'm needy. <laughs> yes, actually. <laughs> yes. Um, and, but I love that. I mean, I love that. It's, it's like, that is sort of, th that's the best part of, of putting your art out into the world is, <laughs> I mean, it really is just the best part in, um, in that sort of recognition. Like for me, this, this work was always about um, being communicative. You know, I, I, I do always like want to say like you write for yourself and um, you have to feel, um, there's no work that I do that feels any good where this like center of it is not my own excitement, my own like obsession and preoccupation, but I wrote, I wrote this book to be read 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and so any sort of engagement with it, even if, even if it's um, like critical, you know, cause that also feels like an expression of care, you know, any engagement with the work, um, it, it feels like that, um, like I have at least succeeded in that sort of attempt to communicate a thing. Um, but yeah, the, the reception has been, I just have felt really lucky and, um, and deeply surprised <laughs> by it. I really didn't co- go in thinking that it would be that way. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it has, it's, I'm, I'm a fan. That's sort of how I operate. It's like how I interact with everything I love is, is through that earnestness. Again, that, that word again, like fandom growing up is really important to me. And so um, like, I, I'm always, I always feel just like kind of full of light when someone has taken the time to er- interact with a thing that I've made, because that's sort of like what I do, <laughs> always what I've done. Um, and yeah. it feels kind of cool to have that energy becoming my way. Yeah, for sure. The fandoms are real, man. They, yeah, they take themselves seriously. Um, <laughs> just sure, is it the same for you? Like, do you feel like you um, have benefited and, and learned things about your b- own book from the interaction with like readers? I have. Well, I haven't, you know, it's these days you're not encountering them on the street. That does sometimes happen. And that is always really fun. Or someone will like have your book in their bag. It's so freaky sometimes. And it truly makes you feel that you're like, oh, I am in a simulation and I am like a protagonist. And it makes you into, you know, a narcissist for one moment where you're like, yes, the world is revolving around me. Um, Yeah. yeah, I'm like, okay, main character, fine over here. But this one, it's, it is a little bit different. I think it was, um, I have a slightly different response to it uh, than Raven. I'm I'm always like, oh, you read my book? How did you get that? I'm always <laughs> like, but my book is over here in my notebook. How did you get my book? And I'm always a little bit surprised. This one feels different though, because it was partly an attempt to memorialize. And that is something that you want to have the widest dissemination possible. Whenever I hear from people, I send their messages to my sister. When I hear from doctors, when I hear from nurses, which I have been so fortunate, so privileged to do, I send them to her. And sometimes it is, it's the thing that makes a difference in her day or makes a difference in my day. I don't want to speak for her, but it's something that has brought us together. Obviously we're still in a process of grief, but the, the world grieves with you, you know, people who have lost children write to me, you know, people who um, have disabled brothers and sisters write to me. And I have heard from so many people. So that is different. You know, I gather those things into my arms. Whereas if it were just the first half of the book, I'd be like, oh, I'm naked in that part. Like I'm very naked at the beginning. I'm taking a shower. Don't look at me. That's how'd you get my book? So yeah. it's different. <laughs> Um, yeah, that is gorgeous. Yeah, just look away, please. Like, I can. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, okay, so before we move on to some audience questions, there's just one last question I have for both of you, which is is a meta question. So I apologize in advance, but um, it was asked of me during like my first ever like book tour, and I thought it was it was a good question because it allowed me to speak on whatever I wanted to speak on, which is. Um, are, is there a question about your book that you always wish you were asked that you currently have not been or that you don't get to speak about enough? And if so, what is that question? And give us the answer, obviously, as well. You, you guys can mull on it for a second if you need to. <laughs> You're both like, I have been asked it before and I never can think of one, which means <laughs> that I need to sit down and do homework after this one and be like, what do I wish yeah, I had been asked? <laughs> I, I don't have one. Raven, do you have one? <laughs> Maybe not, yeah, right? It's um, sort of in the same boat. Um, I, I mean, I always... In- yeah, I mean... I'll say there's just one question I really love, which is like, what are you, what did you listen to? If you listen to, you know, like while you're writing, I always want to know that. That's like, yeah, is what I want to know. Um, what did you listen to? So I, I mean, unsurprisingly, uh, just a ton of disco, <laughs> but also, <laughs> um, also the kind of not opposite. Cause I think that I listen to a, a lot of, uh, kind of like heavy, um, kind of violent genres that I need kind of to calibrate me. They like make my brain feel like controlled. They like kind of help it funnel into one onto the page. Um, So I tend not to listen to like your softer genres. I like, I like fun, um, but I also like, I like heavy. um, And that could either be, that could be metal. That could be like your, your prodigies. That could be, um, that could be your, you could be rap, you know, 
Um, it can also be like your trip hop, but that feels just like deeply sexy music. Also. Sexy music. That's, like, my book would get sexy if I listened to trip hop and I'd be like, wait, we're in the NICU. It's not time for trip hop. Get out of here. <laughs> um, Raven, How about you? Oh yeah, go for, yeah, no, Patricia, go for it. So yeah, um, the, the music in the first half was obviously quite different, but in the second half, I listened almost exclusively like obsessively to uh, Perfume Genius's No Shape, um, which was just very, very good music for that. When I work on a plane though, I always listen to Sun's uh, Pyroclass, which is like um, kind of a noise album. It's very, um, it is metalish, but it's very textured and it also takes away all airplane noises and it puts you in a space where you can both read and write. So I would recommend that if you ever have trouble like tuning I'm stuff take out. That down. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, and I was also after that looking for a bunch more stuff like it and there's really nothing else like it. So I'll send that to you. It has a very cool cover as well. Amazing. Um, Raven, I was going to ask, was the disco scene in the book inspired by your own experiences have you been to a night like that before I mean <laughs> I, I would say yes yeah, some of it some of it is um some of it is drawn absolutely um from from life um though to be honest I just I think there should be more opportunities for nights like those and, and I haven't had as many as I'd like you know um but I would say more than anything the the scene that where they go to see so like you know some Swedish metal, that is more of an experience that I, I've had um, where I was like suddenly in the pit and did not know the rules quite yet. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very easy to get injured in, in those pits, man. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so, all right, we're going to move on to some audience questions now. Thank you so much for bearing with us. Um, to both, what are you writing right now? That is the, the, the big question. Are you taking a break? Have you got other things in the works, Patricia? Let you start. Yeah, so I started, I had COVID in March, 2020 and I had a very crazy case and I had um, a lot of cognitive issues afterwards where I was not really in my right mind. And I kept very extensive notes during this period because I mean, I stayed a writer, I guess, even though I was completely woo out of the loop. And so I'm writing some short stories uh, based on those, which I think is, is interesting. I mean, it's sort of like archival, even, you know, like anthropological Anthropological of the self. Um, and it's just like, why did I have at this moment in time when this was happening to me, the desire to just write down every single bit of it? And then of course, you're, you're glad that you did, that you have the crazy notebooks that I hope someone is going to buy because they're very, very, I'm not overselling these notebooks. You want these <laughs> like in your archives, I promise you, somebody buy these notebooks. <laughs> We're going to see them on eBay when the book comes yeah. out. I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. I've been in um, <laughs> that sounds wicked. I, I look forward to reading that, but obviously also sorry that you went through that experience because that sounds hardcore and, and yeah, a lot to deal with. Um, Raven, are you working on another book? Anything? Yeah, I mean, finally, because <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest with you, it just took a moment for me to find a thread. The other thing I was talking about, about kind of like finding that like thing that actually excites you, like, it just can't be manufactured and and it's miserable to, to kind of be in a mo moment where you just you can't really quite find it and you can't like really do anything. You kind of just have to receive it. And so like now I am working on a new book um, and it is a book that I feel like for me was inevitable to write as like a former Seventh-day Adventist. You know, I, I've always wanted to write about faith and Patricia, yes. you are also like one of my favorite writers on that subject. 100%. Oh, I'm going to blurb it. Send it to me. I'll blurb it the <laughs> hell out of it. If you want me to, I will like write 100%. such a good blurb for it. Yeah, yeah, I will. <laughs> so yeah, it's um, right now I'm still pulling it together and, you know, figure out what it is, but that's what I'm working on. Oh, thank you. That's cool. Thanks for such That's generous cool. answers. Like sometimes when I'm interviewing authors, like they're very like, we can yeah. speak about my future projects. You guys, <laughs> you guys yeah, you're very effusive, which is lovely. <laughs> um, it's also fine not to be effusive. Like I understand the fear of like <laughs> something in it, like not coming to light for some reason. Um, we were also wondering what you're reading at the moment, which is a, is a great question. What's kind of keeping you guys going as, as we still I'm go through? Actually, these um, I'm reading it. It's, it didn't come out recently, but I've, I've had it for a bit uh, and I'm just now getting to it. It is I Like to Watch by Emily Nussbaum. I love it so much. It's a nonfiction book um, and, it, and it's just about 
like our kind of cultural consciousness and consensus around TV. And um, it's a medium also that I, I really love. Um, and she, it, the writing is just so beautiful and, and smart. Um, and I also um, recently read um, The Days of Afrikeet by Asali Solomon. Um, and it is, it's a, it's a slim book. Um, it's, it's a really fast, but like gorgeous read. I think it comes out in the fall. Um, but it is like, it is absolutely one of those books where I picked it up and I, and I wanted to write and I'm always looking for, for that. I'm in a heavy, like urban fantasy, like early eighties urban fantasy period. I'm not sure why it just feels very, um, removed from the current um, circumstances of the world, I think. And it's also imagining like worlds within worlds. So it's things like Little Big um, and things like Mark Halperin's uh, A Winter's Tale or Winter's Tale. Um, and then I sort of picked up on some of this um, like Minneapolis school of urban fantasy that was written in the, like the early 80s and 90s. People like Emma Bull, and, uh, you know, it's basically like imagining fairies on the streets of Minneapolis and that sort of thing. I must have needed something very escapist. Um, but to Charlie's point that sometimes people don't want to talk about their new, new works, it's like I am also secretly working on another novel that's an urban fantasy. So that's yeah. why. <laughs> uh, that's I'm going deep in, yeah. <laughs> of course. Um, Okay, that's beautiful. Um, we've got one final question for you, Patricia, um, which is you refer to the language of poetry being a format that is similar to your form of writing. Do you find that your writing has a life of its own, that it almost flows out subconsciously? Um, I wouldn't say that. Again, I am a chiseler. I'm really getting in there and making myself sweat blood. The only experience I have really of things pouring out, um, that happened with Rape Joke. Um, and it also happened with the second half of the book where it was uh, strict, it was compulsive, really, that I was writing down everything as it happened and not wanting to lose any small piece of it. Um, but I think if you prepare your language in the same way that you don't have to write moral characters, you don't have to write moral stories, but you have to do the work on yourself so that a bunch of fucked up shit doesn't end up in your books that you don't know about, right? Like, I believe that that is, is basically what we need to be doing when it comes to books. But I think when it comes to your language, you prepare it with poetry um, or someone like me does. You prepare it um, with your reading, with the books that make you want to write. And if you have that, that does something to your language on its way out. Um, you don't have to work as much on it then because you've sort of like rolled out a red carpet for it. Um, and it goes back a very long way. Writers do have to be readers, I think, absolutely. And you have to find the books that every single sentence is a trigger. For me, like one of the biggest ones is, um, uh, Cesar Ira's Ghosts, almost every single paragraph, I'm like, oh, there's something, there's something. And you almost don't even read the book because every line is such a such a trigger for you to write something yourself. That's brilliant. I'm going to hold on to rolling out the red carpet. Yes, yeah. <laughs> for the language, yes. <laughs> rolling it out. Um, amazing. Um, thank you both so much. Just to round off, do you have any final questions for each other? If not, we'll let you go and enjoy your days. I guess you guys are in America, so it's, you've probably got the whole day ahead of it's you. It's a day-ish, yeah. It's like three times. We have some daylight left <laughs> a little bit. Um, well, I just wanted to just say what a pleasure this was. This was really, really wonderful. This was a really good conversation, genuinely. Um, we were talking a little bit beforehand about how, you know, when you're doing these Zooms, you want to be in the same room with these people. And, you know, I, I always try to like crawl into my computer a little bit so I can get to the people I'm talking to or when they're talking, I'm nodding extremely, almost performatively. But it's because you want to be really talking to these people and want to really be in a room with them. Um, and I would have enjoyed having this conversation um, in a room with both of you um, and maybe this time next year, you know, um, but it was it was wonderful as it was as well. Amazing. Thank you both so much. Have you have either of you been to Edinburgh before, by the way? No. Yes, I have. Nice. Yes. 
It's, oh, it's, yes, I, I love Edinburgh. And also I was going to say in the opening credits, there was a little movie and I think that I saw uh, an excellent poet, Harry Josephine Giles in that video. So if so, shout out to Harry Josephine. Um, but yes, I loved Edinburgh. Um, we went on a big tour of Scotland two years ago. We went to the Isle of Skye. Uh, we went to the fairy pools. We did everything. It was so, I loved it so much. And I finally learned um, what a moor was because as a child, I would be reading like Wuthering Heights and I'm like is she in the ocean is she in a field I have no idea like what this body of land is that they're talking about and it is kind of both it's like grass but then you it's all slurchy when you step into it with your big boots so you gotta go you gotta do all that yeah more is there. they are they are they're, they're a thing more's yeah. are a, more's are huge okay everybody's gotta get into a more <laughs> yeah. um Raven when you're when you're here next year obviously we'll take you to a more we'll right. take you on a more tour yeah <laughs> be a lot of fun um <laughs> thank you both so so much um thank and you. to our lovely audience as well um if you'd like to buy either of these brilliant books please head to shop.edbookfest.co.uk um and thank you for the edinburgh international book festival for having us let's do it again soon yeah